My name is Mark Siegler, and with Dr. Marshall Chin. Marshall, are you in the audience? Oh, yeah, Marshall is up here. Uh, we, we've put this uh, series of 28 lecture seminars together for the year. Um, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence, uh, I welcome you to this, our 32nd annual seminar series. As you know, uh, this year, our focus is on the ethical issues in healthcare reform. In, in 2010, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, the ACA, into law. The ACA is unquestionably the greatest restructuring of the American healthcare system since Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. Uh, I was on the clinical wards as a medical student in 1965, when Medicare and Medicaid uh, first became the law. We're delighted that this year's seminar series will bring together national, state, and local experts to help us better understand how health reform and the ACA will shape the future of American health care. A number of our programs this year, uh, eight in fact, beginning with today's lecture by David Axelrod, will be co-sponsored with the Institute of Politics, uh, this wonderful new institute that came to the University of Chicago uh, in the last year, uh, directed by Mr. Axelrod. Next Wednesday, for example, on October 9, uh, here in the same room at the same time, uh, Dr. Mark McClellan, the former director of CMS, will talk about next steps for healthcare reform. And other speakers that the Institute of Politics uh, is co-sponsoring with us will include Austin Goolsby, Dr. Albert Wang, Nancy Ann DeParle, uh, Dr. Bekera Kuker, uh, Julie Hamos, and Neera Tandon. Uh, th these lectures will be part of the larger series of 28 talks. We're particularly thrilled today uh, to welcome David Axelrod to help us kick off the series. As I show on the first slide, uh, we'd like this to be an uh, off-the-record talk so that Mr. Axelrod can be as candid as possible. Uh, th that would mean, if, if, you, if you please, no tweeting and no blogging uh, f from this event. Um, and Mr. Axelrod is a political strategist and, and the director of the New Institute at Chicago. Um, a graduate of the University of Chicago um, in 1976. He spent eight years as a reporter and columnist for the Chicago Trib. I'm told he was the youngest columnist in their history. In 1992, uh, Mr. Axelrod um, met Barack Obama and in 2004 joined his senatorial campaign and later served as senior advisor to Senator Obama during the presidential campaign in 2008. Mr. Axelrod then served in the White House as senior advisor to the president, and in 2012 was again the senior strategist in Mr. Obama's re-election campaign. Following the 2012 campaign, David Axelrod turned his focus here to the University of Chicago and the Institute of Politics to help inspire and train in a nonpartisan way the next generation of leaders. As director of the Institute of Politics, Mr. Axelrod oversees a wonderful team. I've worked with many of them uh, for today's event, a team that brings leading practitioners and policymakers to campus to discuss wide-ranging issues to help us understand both our current political landscape and how we can best prepare the next generation to become effective global leaders. The Institute of Politics has three core programs at its center. A fellows program, which brings political and policy practitioners to campus for an academic quarter. An internship and civic engagement program, which provides paid opportunities for undergraduate students to get hands-on experience in public service. And a speaker series, of which we're part, which brings eminent public speakers to campus to discuss current events, political life, and policy issues that shape our world and communities. Please join me in giving the warmest welcome to David Axelrod. Mark, I, I, I want to uh, first 
congratulate you on this series and on all the provocative programs that you've brought to this campus. Uh, I can't think of a more important uh, series to have because of what you said, because of the importance of the Affordable uh, Care Act. And I look forward to uh, working with you uh, during the course of this series. I also, modesty uh, forbade uh, Dr. Siegler from mentioning that one of the splendid people who uh, works with us at the IOP is his daughter, Dylan, who is a force of nature, as you might imagine, <laughs> and uh, has coordinated our internship programs and has worked very closely with our students and uh, is a great gift to us. So I thank you uh, for that as well. Uh, and I thank all of you. I know that um, as we talk about the Affordable Care Act this year, that many of you are going to be on the front lines uh, of uh, delivering uh, on the Affordable Care Act, dealing with the changes that it brings and the opportunities that it, uh, that it offers. And I should say parenthetically, because I see some of his colleagues uh, here in the audience, that I, I feel a special affinity uh, for this institution because my father-in-law, Richard Landau, an endocrinologist was on the medical faculty here for 60 years. And so uh, there's, there, I have a familial tie uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this institution. When people ask me about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, um, they often ask me, did we know it was going to be so difficult? And the answer is, hell yes, <laughs> absolutely. When you consider the history of health reform in this country, there have been presidents dating back 65 years uh, uh, trying to achieve universal health care and some of the reforms that are included in this, uh, in this law. Uh, seven presidents tried, seven presidents failed. Uh, Bill Clinton had uh, a huge majority for health reform uh, back uh, in uh, the early 90s uh, at the beginning, and the bill never actually came for a vote. Uh, on the floor because health reform is complicated and people's uh, feelings about health reform and, and, and health care generally uh, are complicated. So while there are real concerns about the cost of health care, we have the, you all know that we have the least efficient health care system among all the industrialized nations. We spend 17 percent of our GDP on health care. The next country down spends 11 percent and yet our outcomes are, uh, are oftentimes worse uh, there's some recognition of that. People certainly feel the cost of, uh, of health care, but there's also uh, a real concern about losing control and choice uh, within the health care system, and this has made this a, a highly emotional, highly charged issue for a very long time. Senator Obama uh, felt strongly that we had to act on health care. I was reading this morning, uh, rereading his uh, book, The Audacity of Hope, and he uh, made the case for why we needed to uh, proceed on health reform. And it had to do with uh, two factors, runaway health care inflation, which was uh, uh, approaching double digits year after year, and the growing number of uh, uninsured, uh, which was going to be exact, which were, uh, was exacerbated by changes in the economy. Um, and uh, he laid out in that book uh, a plan that very much resembles the law uh, the law that was passed. Um, when he ran for president in the primaries, health reform was a major issue. Uh, it was a big concern, particularly to activists uh, within the Democratic Party. He ran largely on the plan he laid out in that book. And the truth is that he ran into significant criticism uh, during the primary uh, season for not going far enough. There were many people who wanted a single payer uh, health care system. He didn't support, uh, as a candidate for president, a, uh, an, a, man, a mandate for adults. He supported a mandate for children. Uh, and still, when we got to the general election um, and we started doing research uh, with voters, uh, what we found was that just uh, supporting health reform and the kind of plan that he had proposed uh, uh, made him highly vulnerable. It was a big concern uh, of ours in uh, the general election against John McCain when we had all the wind at our back. I mean, people sometimes doubt that we had any concerns in that race, but we really did. And this was one of them because what we learned when we tested uh, uh, our plan 
and some of the attacks against it was that it, it concerned people and ran into this th these third rail issues that uh, I mentioned earlier. And so we actually ended up running nine ads on health care in the general election, and they were all aimed at uh, avoiding being attacked by McCain. It, it, was, it was aimed at obviating uh, the advantage uh, that he had. And it was aimed at sort of placing us in the middle. McCain had supported uh, a health care plan that would have fully taxed health care benefits. It didn't include insurance reforms. Uh, we, we, we knew that that made him vulnerable himself. And so we tried to plant ourselves in the middle of the debate in the general election. And there are a couple of, I'll show you a couple of the ads <coughs> that we ran, which will give you a sense of what the politics were uh, on this issue in, in 2008 as we were running for president. Tim, or can we just show, uh, let's just show the first two. So hold off for one second. So you can see that we, as I said, tried to plant ourselves in the middle. I can tell you this was an extremely effective ad. It was, it, 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 again, you know, from 20,000 feet, it's easy to make the argument. And people really uh, embraced it. And uh, um, I can uh, also tell you that there were folks who called him after the ad, people who were sympathetic uh, to him, uh, Senator Kennedy being one of them expressing some concern about the ad uh, because of the way it positioned uh, government uh, run health care. But we felt we needed to do that in order to keep the issue from being exploited uh, by McCain. Similarly, uh, let's look at the second, uh, let's look at the second ad. I'm Barack Obama, I approve this message. It could all run around your health care under John McCain. McCain would tax health benefits for the first time ever, meaning higher income taxes for millions. His plan would raise costs for employers offering health care, so the coverage would be reduced to free and drop completely. And since McCain won't require coverage for pre existing conditions, finding a new plan will be viewed hanging by a thread. It's not the change we need. Um, and as I said, there were nine, nine such ads. Um, it, it basically took the health care issue out of play and, and actually um, disadvantaged uh, McCain. Um, but, and then we were elected. And then the, the, uh, the uh, discussion became, what, what do we do? Um, the one thing that when all of this was going on um, wasn't entirely clear was just how profound the economic crisis we were about to enter would be. By the time mid-December rolled around, uh, we were having meetings uh, uh, and in which our economic advisors were describing the potential of a uh, economic crisis as deep uh, as the uh, uh, as anything that we'd seen since the Great Depression. In fact, uh, our economic advisor said there was one in, a one in three chance that we could experience a second Great Depression, which is something that you thought was relegated to history books. Uh, and so we became an economic triage unit uh, trying to save the economy from uh, pitching into a depression, trying to save the American auto industry, uh, standing up the financial industry, which was badly damaged. And by the way, none of this was very, po uh, pos uh, was very uh, popular. Um, when we were putting the Recovery Act together to kind of fill the hole in our, uh, in our economy, uh, with s accelerated spending. One of the things the president said is, I, want, I don't want to just spend money, I want to spend money for a, a purpose. One of the things that he insisted was included uh, in the health care bill was health care IT. And this was an anticipation of uh, health reform. Uh, it, it, it's something that he had written about. It was a, you know, a crying need to tie our health care system together in such a way as to 
make records available, uh, do away with duplicative tests, and uh, make the system more efficient. So that was included in the healthcare. But the real question was, do we proceed or do we not uh, on the healthcare plan in the midst of all uh, of everything else that we were facing? And uh, uh, we had a, a, a very, as I say in Washington, free and frank discussion about this. Uh, and there were strong arguments on, on both sides. There were the proponents of health reform uh, who felt that uh, this was the moment that he had made the commitment that, uh, and that we had to move. And, and frankly, there were others on the political side, and I was one of them, who had concerns about it. And let me just say at this point that this was a very difficult thing for me personally uh, because I've interacted with the healthcare system in a very um, uh, intensive way over the course of my life because uh, in uh, 1982, when my daughter uh, was seven months old, we lived here in Hyde Park. My wife called me and said she had found the baby blue and limp in the crib. At first, she thought she had died. And then she saw this strange phenomenon of her arm going back and her eyes rolling back. She didn't know what was happening, and she r raced here to this medical center. And uh, we were told at first that it was probably a febrile seizure. She had had a cold uh, and that it would pass. And a month later, we were released, and she was still having five to 10 seizures a day. This was the beginning of a long nightmare for us. At the time, I was a uh, young newspaper reporter. My insurance wasn't particularly good. And uh, her medications were very expensive. And uh, we were among the Americans who almost went bankrupt as a result of uh, gaps in the healthcare system. So I felt very passionately about this issue, but my job was to provide political input to the president. And uh, it was frankly a daunting prospect to take this on in the midst of everything else. Thought the safer path might be to work on education reform, which was a more unifying issue. And, uh, and he listened to all the arguments and uh, finally said, um, you know, what are we here for? Are we here to put our approval rating on the shelf and admire it, or are we here to spend it down and try and achieve something last, of lasting importance for the country? Uh, and he said, I know this could be tough, but I think we have to try. If we don't do it in the first two years, it's probably not going to get done. And if it doesn't go, get done now, um, it is, uh, a pro uh, you know, you have a real prospect of the healthcare system imploding. Uh, governments, businesses, and families dealing with this health inflation, more and more people uninsured. He said, we got we to gotta try. And of course, that's why I love the guy. I always say I, I, I like him so much because he listens to me so little. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so began uh, the uh, movement for the Affordable Care Act. And um, it was, the, the great challenge was that um, the focus was going to be on how we cover the uninsured. And 85% of Americans had insurance. And so uh, their assumption was that this was for someone else, not for them. Even though the Affordable Care Act included uh, a very robust patient's bill of rights prevents uh, people from being uh, thrown off their insurance uh, if they hit caps. Uh, obviously, the whole issue of, um, of pre-existing conditions uh, allows uh, kids to stay on their health, uh, their parents' health coverage until the age of 26. And there was a whole array of, uh, you know, ca uh, capped the amount of administrative and executive costs and executive pay insurance companies could uh, uh, take from premiums. All of this was positive for people who had insurance, um, but all the coverage was focused on covering 30 million uninsured Americans uh, and the cost of such a program. And no matter how hard we tried to change, divert that discussion, that was what the debate uh, was about. Um, we had at the beginning uh, the problem of a, a strategic decision that the Republican Party had made in the, in the Congress that as Senator McConnell said, we weren't going to give him any major victory on any issue because that would signify that he's figured out this whole 
bipartisanship thing. And they knew that was central to his message. And he said we weren't going to give him that. And there was very well enforced party discipline. We had long talks with Republicans in the Senate. And the, the Affordable Care Act, in many of its principles, was predicated on plans that had been introduced by Republicans in the past. It was a market-oriented plan that involved building on the health care system as it existed, uh, creating, a, a, as we now see in the last couple of days, crea creating a marketplace in which people could buy private insurance at a, at a price they could uh, afford. And, so, and there were people still on the Republican side in the Senate who had worked on that issue and had supported such a proposal in the past. One of them sat in the President's office uh, for two hours during the course of the discussions uh, in 2009 and said, and the President said, well, we agree on 99% of this. Uh, can we, can you support this? And he said, well, not unless you can find another 10 Republicans to go with it, because I'm not going to stand out there by myself. And we ran into that problem uh, repeatedly. But by the summer, uh, some of the uh, uh, angst about health reform generally uh, became popularized um, in the Tea Party movement. Uh, some of the organized opposition uh, leaped in. It became integrated in the, uh, uh, in the uh, drive for, uh, uh, you know, for the Republican elections from 2010. So that, uh, that became uh, a complicating uh, factor. We, uh, we also, you know, when the president talked about health care as a candidate, he said, we're going to have a big negotiation and we're going to do it on C-SPAN and I'm going to, you know, everybody will have a seat at the table. He said, I remember, because I heard this line a hundred times, he said, you know, I'll have the biggest chair, but everybody else will have a chair too. <laughs> and, um, um, but the truth is that um, legislating something, anything is more complicated than that, and legislating something as complex as this uh, proved to be far more complicated than that. And so we, we never achieved the level of transparency that, that had been, Promised, and there were. Um, there's no doubt that there were um, deals and understandings made, as there are around every piece of uh, legislation. Some of them um, were uh, people found obnoxious, um, and the whole thing culminated at the end of uh, uh, 2009 in the special election in Massachusetts when uh, Senator Kennedy died. It, it was the ultimate irony that the the number one proponent of health reform in the Senate had passed away, and uh, his replacement ran uh, uh, promising to thwart uh, health reform. Uh, and there was a lot of, uh, there was a gen the general sense was that people were reading last rites over the health reform bill. I see my old colleague from the White House, Susan Scheer, here. She remembers that, I'm sure, very, very well. There was a lot of doom and gloom about it. But as was true throughout the whole process, the President was very resolute that he wasn't going to give up on this. In fact, in the middle of the health care debate, we had a meeting on a particularly difficult day, and the President asked his legislative director, Phil Shalero, uh, what he thought the chances of actually passing the bill uh, were. And Phil said, well, it depends how lucky you feel, Mr. President. And the president just laughed and said, hey, I'm a black guy named Barack Obama, and I'm president of the United States. <laughs> he said, I, I feel lucky every day. Uh, but he, he in, uh, in, you know, every time someone wanted to throw in the towel, he refused to do it because he felt it was so important uh, for the country in the future to, uh, uh, to pursue this. And he was, uh, I went into his office in the, summer of 2009 in the midst of all this madness. And you know, I, I showed him polling that's, I said, look, you, you need to know we're taking water on, uh, on this issue. And he said, you know, I know you're right, but I just got back from uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I met a woman 36 years old, has health insurance, she's married, she has children, her husband works as well, and, but she has stage four breast cancer, now she's reached the caps. And she's terrified that she's going to die and leave her family bankrupt. By now, I felt his, we were standing in the Oval Office, and I felt his hand in the small of my back leading me to the door. And he said, uh, he said, that's not the country we believe in. So let's just keep fighting. And so after the Massachusetts race, um, every, there, was, there was a fair amount of opinion that this was not a doable 
thing. And he said, no, no, we're going to get this done. He said, but I think we should um, regroup. Let's, we've got a, a lot to do on the jobs issue. We're going to talk about that in the next three weeks. And meanwhile, we're going to put this back together. One of his um, insights was to try and um, recoup the transparency that had been lost by holding a marathon session at the Blair House with the Republican uh, and Democratic uh, members of Congress to talk about health care. It was a remarkable session, some of you may remember. I think it lasted seven hours. And the president just was in a colloquy with all of these members on health care on television. And uh, it was actually a pretty good moment for, uh, for democracy. Uh, and then the bill passed. It was uh, crafted in a, uh, I think, a politically uh, astute way in that uh, the things that kicked in first were the health insurance reforms, uh, children over 26, end of the caps, uh, uh, more coverage for Medicare prescription drugs for uh, senior citizens, um, uh, catastrophic sort of health care plans for, the, uh, for people with pre-existing conditions who ultimately would be covered when the exchanges kicked in. Um, one thing I should do is back up and say, I, mi I missed a major point here. Um, when uh, we started talking in the, in the winter of 2009 about whether we should go forward, um, our policy people made a strong case that we couldn't reduce costs without taxing at least some of the health care exemption to try and discourage these kind of Cadillac plans that were wasteful. And um, they also argued that we couldn't uh, cover people with pre-existing conditions unless everybody was in the system, hence the mandate. And you know, he poked and prodded on this, and he became convinced that that was the case as well. So those were the two most un popular features of health reform, and, um, but they were also uh, necessary to make it work, and uh, he, um, he incorporated them into the system. Uh, so uh, again, we, we, we implemented the, 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 the most uh, popular and uh, uh, in many ways the easiest parts of the Health Reform Act uh, leading up to, uh, to now, uh, but it was always the case that you know, this, this piece was going to be uh, very complicated because you're sendi setting up big markets that, um, uh, that haven't, hadn't existed before. And, um, you know, we, we know, and you could see yesterday, I mean, the good news about yesterday was that the demand was um, essential. Uh, I mean, the demand was overwhelming. And uh, even though there were glitches in the system, um, the notion that people aren't interested in health reform, I think, was uh, uh, rebuffed by the huge numbers of people who went on these, uh, on these uh, sites. I want to show you a little bit of polling to say where we are um, now. You know, there is this, uh, the re Republican uh, or the opposition mantra to health reform is that um, you know, most Americans oppose it. And it misses uh, an important point. Let's, uh, oh, uh, about 14 to 16 percent of people who say they oppose health reform oppose it not because they think it goes too far, but because they don't think it goes far enough. And when you add that to the people who support health reform, it's a, it's a majority. And for that reason, a majority of Americans want to make the law work. There is not a majority for this notion that we should scuttle uh, the Affordable Care Act. Let's look at the next slide. Um, and here, here's the point I was making before. Um, you can see that 54% uh, uh, opposed, but in 16% uh, uh, say that the law didn't go far enough. And these are mostly single payer uh, people. Let's look at the next slide. Um, and here you can see by 57 to 36, this is, uh, it says, oh, I see, a fairly recent poll. Uh, by a more than a 20 point margin, people want to make the law work. There, and, and what you hear from people is, we, don't, we know this isn't going to be perfect. We've got concerns about it. But let's fix it as we move along rather than um, go backwards. People do not want to go uh, backwards. There is obviously a partisan skew to this. 
Um, 44, uh, and this has to do with the shutdown here, but 44% of Republicans support cutting off funding and believe it's worth a shutdown. Uh, that's not true of independent voters or Democrats who are uh, hugely opposed to that. But what's interesting is even within the Republican Party, uh, among Tea Party Republicans, 64% uh, uh, say they want the law to fail. Uh, among uh, uh, Tea Party Republicans who oppose the Affordable Care Act, 44% want Congress to make it work, and 31% non-Tea Party, I'm sorry, Republicans, 44% want Congress to make it work, and 31% want to make it fail. So there you see the divide uh, within the Republican Party. And um, what we have is, a, you know, the rewards in our political system have led to a kind of stasis that we have today because many of these Tea Party Republicans are aggregated in congressional districts that are homogenous. Eighty percent of our congressional districts are not competitive. And therefore, the only thing that people fear are primaries within their own party. And so uh, the strong activist Tea Party based within the Republican Party in these congressional districts give these members a sense that uh, from a political standpoint, from their own, for their own well-being, that they should, uh, uh, you know, wage this um, relentless war uh, on the affordable, on the Affordable Care Act. Um, I don't know how the current standoff is going to resolve itself. Just to save someone a question. <laughs> and nor do I think that uh, anyone in Washington really knows how. It's going to end. I know the president feels strongly that he's not going to negotiate at the point of a gun, and he's not going to. He's certainly not going to um, uh, uh, undermine the Affordable Care Act uh, in order to sue for peace. Uh, so he's taken a fairly hard line. I, th I see the Republican Party trying to make, um, trying to make, uh, trying to find a way out, trying to find a pole to slide down, to get out of what has become an awkward uh, situation. Uh, for them, and it can only, and, and the seriousness of it could get even greater if they tie, as some say they will, tie uh, a, a delay of the Affordable Care Act, a delay of the mandate, which is you can understand the political logic behind them landing on that, uh, uh, to the impending uh, vote on the debt ceiling and raising the debt ceiling. Because if we don't deal with that, we we will default on America's bills and plunge the world probably back into a recession. So, you know, that's a heavy threat to try and, and uh, but uh, I think he feels strongly that uh, if we set the precedent that you can extort those kinds of concessions, um, then uh, you're creating the circumstances that will repeat themselves again and again and again. So I don't ex expect that he's going to uh, yield on this point. So I don't know what's going to happen. What I strongly believe is that the Affordable Care Act, however, is going to uh, I think it is on its way. Many aspects of this uh, act are now um, uh, actually appreciated by the people who are benefiting from them. If any of you have kids who are uh, under the age of 26, you know that. People who have hit their caps know that, seniors. I don't think the Congress is going to take that away. I think these exchanges are going to be bumpy um, because of the nature of starting something uh, this ambitious. Uh, from scratch. I think they're going to be bumpier in states where governors and legislatures have been uh, committed to uh, blocking the Affordable Care Act and the federal government has had to, uh, had to uh, um, move in to set up the exchanges. The irony of that, of course, is that many of those states are the states with the highest number of uninsured uh, in the country. So it's kind of a shame for the people in those states. Texas, for example, just to choose one at random, um, <laughs> has the uh, largest number of uninsured in the country. I think it's now approaching 28 percent. So I don't know that all of them feel well served by Senator Cruz uh, when he filibusters against the Affordable, uh, Affordable Care Act. But I, I believe that um, the way this is structured with its uh, s uh, largely self-sufficient independent funding mechanisms the, the Affordable Care Act is going to move forward. And, uh, you know, as we look at the ruckus around it, 
Uh, I, I, I took the opportunity to look back at some of the debate before other major social insurance programs, Social Security, Medicare, and it was really striking how some of the rhetoric, if not the tactics, uh, were the same. Uh, uh, you know, so pe people calling Social Security Marxism. Uh, Ronald Reagan in 1961 said Medicare would be the end of freedom as we know it. Um, and you don't hear, I, I don't hear any Tea Party Republicans saying that about Medicare today. Now, now we have people holding up signs saying keep, Medi keep the government's hands off of my Medicare. <laughs> Someone missed their civics class. Um, but I, so I believe that it's going to move forward. I think we're going to look back in five and ten years uh, and certainly generations from now and uh, applaud the decision that we made. I think it will encourage best practices. I think it certainly will mean that people who didn't get insurance could get insurance. And let me just end uh, on that uh, note because um, one of my most poignant memories, powerful memories of being in the White House was the night the Affordable Care Act passed. And um, a bunch of us, and I don't know, Susan, if you were there, but we're in the uh, Roosevelt Room at the White House, the team that worked on uh, the, uh, the, the bill, the president, the vice president, as the final votes were being tallied in the House of Representatives. My office was nearby. And uh, as the final votes came in, I found myself, uh, I got up, went into my office, closed the door, and, uh, and wept. And it was surprising to me, you know. Um, I mean, I'm a crier, but this was, <laughs> But this sort of, uh, I was surprised to be so overcome, and I thought about it. I thought about why, and I realized it was because I, of the experience that we had when my daughter was young, and the anguish that we felt, uh, worrying about whether we could afford to get her uh, the care that she needed. And I knew that because of what we had done, that in the future other families wouldn't have to uh, suffer uh, as, as uh, that kind of anxiety, or worse, uh, and uh, that made everything we were doing there real. You know, these things get covered as sort of who wins and who loses and who scores points and who positions for the next election. Uh, but there's real fundamental meaning uh, to this for millions and millions of people. And I found the president, and I uh, still verklempt, and I thanked him on behalf of all those families like mine who aren't going to have to go through that. And uh, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, that's why we do the work. And uh, that's why we do the work. And now you guys are going to have to do the work of helping us make it work. Uh, but uh, I do believe that it, it is going to work. I think it's going to be bumpy. It's going to be noisy. It's going to be an issue in the next uh, campaign, although per perhaps less of an issue that, than people think uh, today. But I do believe that uh, health reform and the Affordable Care Act is, is, uh, is here to stay. And while there may be some changes along the way, uh, and there should be, uh, and there may be adjustments along the way. Uh, in the main, uh, the law that's in place is going to survive, and I think it's going to prosper. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Well, you know, I think that um, uh, there is significant resistance to a single-payer system. Uh, you know, I think if you were to, and this is me speaking not for the president, I think if you were to start all over again and you were designing a system from scratch, that that would be a logical place to begin. Uh, but we have a system that people are well invested in. And so I don't know, I don't want to predict that there's going to be uh, that kind of uh, uh, full transition. Um, but. Uh, uh, but I do think that those, the numbers on support will change. I mean, there, there were, the numbers on support on some of the previous social insurance programs were very mixed as well. And I think the numbers will change as the program becomes more uh, familiar to people, uh, as uh, the, the fears they have are not, um, uh, do not materialize, and as some of the benefits they, uh, that accrue uh, become more uh, evident to them. Um, now whether, you know, in time the economics of medicine drive you in that direction, I don't, you guys would have a better sense of that than I could, but I'm here to talk about politics as a political matter. I think we're a long way from that. 
Yes. I was in Washington on Monday, and someone asked me what I was doing there, and I said, I, I like to go where the inaction is. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, look, I, I personally am a supporter of um, redistricting reform. I think that uh, what they've done in California and some other states is the right way to go, where you redistrict in ways that are nonpartisan, and districts that are created uh, are more uh, diverse in terms of um, views. So part of it is a function of, uh, of uh, uh, ge sort of geographic patterns of where people are settling, so you get districts that become more homogenous. But I think that a lot of it has to do with political gerrymandering. And look, I'm a Democrat. In this state, we've benefited from it. We, we, we squeezed out four extra seats after the redistricting here. In uh, North Carolina, it went the other way. So 53% of the vote uh, was Democratic for Congress, and Democrats got 27% of the seats. Um, and uh, I think it would be great to have redistricting reform. It's going to be hard to accomplish. Some states it can be done by initiative, and I think voters could, will support that. The other thing to look at also now being done in California are what they call the jungle primary, which doesn't sound like a solution to gridlock, I guess, but, uh, but it really is, which is everybody runs on the same ballot in the primary, Republicans and Democrats, and the top two finishers um, run it. It could be two Democrats or two Republicans, but it creates a market for moderation, and I think that would be valuable. We're, by the way, going to do some uh, programs uh, this uh, quarter at the uh, IOP on the state of our democracy and some of these uh, reforms and have some debate and discussion uh, on that. Amy Walters, one of our visiting uh, fellows, is, a, uh, is, is, is an expert on, on, congr on Congress and congressional elections. Um, so uh, I invite you to, and anyone to come over and join us for that. I was wondering about one of the um, public polling numbers um, you just showed. Uh, with regards to uh, how many people want the uh, law to work and how many people want to stop funding for it. And it seems like over the course of the past two and a half or three years, um, the number of people who do not want it to work is like gradually increasing, though like a small number but noticeable. And the people who want to defund it actually is slowly increasing. And I was just wondering if both sides are pushing for their opinions why is the side that wants Obamacare to work not being able to sway more public opinion, especially when now some states have partially implemented it? So we could argue that some folks are already seeing the benefits. Yeah, first let me challenge, a little bit challenge the initial premise because in the, if you look at like a lot of data, uh, what's striking isn't so much um, how the numbers have changed but how they've stayed the same. The opposition has generally been within the same range. The support has generally been within the same range. That varies in some public polls, but in credible polls that I, I see, I've seen uh, less rather than more uh, uh, variation. But I, I think that um, the jury is out in the minds of many. There, there's so little information, first of all. There's such, a, there's such a gap of information about the Affordable Care Act. And um, so, uh, you know, and that's been, one of the things I want to mention is that the opponents of the Affordable Care Act have on television until now outspent the proponents by five to one. And so negative characterizations of the Affordable Care Act are much more prevalent. Uh, obviously, there's been a big effort um, in, on, uh, on talk radio on the right and, and cable. Uh, in this regard. But I think that um, uh, it's going to take uh, time to implement this for people to see the impacts of it, uh, for attitudes to change uh, about it. Uh, one thing that's happened now is that the insurance industry realizes that they have skin in the game and they're spending more money. Uh, you know, they're, they're spending serious money now advertising, trying to get people to sign up for these pools. Because as, as you all know, one of the tests for the Affordable Care Act and these exchanges is, are these markets broad enough? And will uh, younger, healthier people sign up for uh, these pools so as to hold down overall uh, costs? It is a fundamental mission uh, to make that happen. And the insurance industry is now advertising on the law, probably going to help 
in some regard. But I think ultimately it's going to take implementation uh, to change those numbers. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I counsel people not to get too wrapped up in polling in the short term uh, on this. But I am amused by the opponents who say, well, you know, majority uh, opposed the law because I also saw a majority, like 85% who thought we ought to have background checks for guns, and that didn't seem to move them. So. <laughs> Can we, we got, I feel bad about these folks who yes, are can. standing. They're standing and wanting to ask a question. Uh, you better be a gentle question now that I <laughs> took up the case for you. I'll ask it very gently. Um, I, I, I came here because I was really interested in the, in the title, which was the ethics of healthcare reform. And I'm a little bit disappointed that, uh, first of all, the question of profit making in healthcare was not addressed um, at all, and uh, also the cost of healthcare, which, as we know, of the healthcare in some of the other countries you mentioned, you didn't mention by name, um, they're non not for profit healthcare. So, c could you just address that a little bit? Yeah, first of all, let me say I think the title of this entire series is The Ethics of Health Reform. Correct. So, there are how many? 28? 28. Yeah. There are 28 sessions on this, and um, I, if, I, if, I, if mine falls short of the expectations, I, I apologize. But um, uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the cost, I think that, 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 that is a, obviously a huge issue. And um, uh, so part of what the Affordable Care Act is meant to do is to make health care affordable for people for whom it's unaffordable now. But it's also meant to encourage uh, the kinds of practices that will reduce health costs over time. And we've seen a reduction in the last several years in terms of the health care inflation that's marked. And you know, at first it, the question was, is that a result of the uh, recession? Uh, or is it a result of uh, effects of the Affordable Care Act? I think some of the studies that I've seen suggest that a quarter to a third may be attributed to the Affordable uh, Care Act. But certainly encouraging uh, uh, a more efficient, I mean, I think the theory of the Affordable Care Act is that you can be both more efficient and more effective in providing health care and by you know, reducing infection rates, by using health care IT, by doing a range of things, uh, by going to bundling of care rather than uh, Fee for service, uh, a variety of things to uh, reduce costs, and that was one of the impetuses for uh, the Health Care Act. Because at the course, uh, course and speed that we were on at the time that this debate took place, if we continued that way, as the president said to us, the health care system would eventually implode, and uh, you know that's a reality that uh, I, I think we've helped. Uh, that, that's a prospect that we've helped reduce by passing this act, but it needs to be implemented properly. Let's maybe we should take a question from the front. Uh, thank you for your talk. I just had a question. It seemed like the 2012 election was uh, in some ways framed as a referendum on health care reform. And obviously the president won, and I think shortly afterward, uh, Speaker Boehner even came on in an interview and yeah. said that this is the law of the land. We're essentially going to move on. So I was just wondering how much of the, yet again, we're having this talk and the shutdown and everything. I was wondering how much of it is, I guess, uh, an internal battle just within the Republican Party that I guess the president is less, you know, has less power in, in, in moving and whether it's just, uh, I guess, the increasing right wing elements uh, pushing the, the more moderates, I guess, in the Republican Party to bring it up again. Because I, I know in terms of the shutdown, a lot of people say, well, you know, why are, you know, what's the rationale? But the political calculus seems pretty clear because a lot of these, you know, representatives were elected to oppose health care reform in yeah. many cases. Well, that's the point that I made before. You're right that Speaker Boehner did say that. Others said that. Um, I guess you could attribute it to short-term memory loss. <laughs> but I don't think that's it. I, I think that the political pressures within the Republican Party were such that, you know, he's had to give ground 
uh, on that for the reasons that I was discussing before, that, that, that within the Republican caucus and within the activist Republican ranks, um, the, this has become sort of uh, the great white whale uh, and they're uh, pursuing it with the maniacal uh, energy of Captain Ahab, you know, and, uh, and the speaker's responding uh, to that, I mean, it is a, he, at some point he's going to, it appears as if there's a majority in his caucus even to move on now, uh, and at some point he's going to have to confront this. But look, there are, there, there, there's a dynamic situation in the Republican Party, it's a divided party. Um, you're right, the president w won an election, uh, on, uh, and the Affordable Care Act was part of it. It was a little confused because Governor Romney, of course, was the author of a health care act that very much resembled the one that we passed, and so it limited his ability to critique uh, the law, and that's what the argument is among some of the Republicans. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the, everybody was aware of the Affordable Care Act. It was out there. There's advertising on it. The president got reelected. But in those districts, uh, where the folks who are now uh, uh, moving the dynamic in the House uh, are elected, I'm sure that 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 uh, uh, support for the Affordable Care Act and the president were low. Let's take a few more questions, Sam. Broad. We are admired, we are criticized, but there's one area, namely healthcare, where the world doesn't understand this country. How come that the majority of the world has care for, in one form or another, for the entire population? And we, a country that is very advanced, do not have it. And so when I talk with people, when I travel, they say they cannot understand how we can be so backward in this sense. So in the president's travels, has that been approached? What kind of message he gets well, from abroad? I, I, you know, I think you're right that there are a lot, I mean, I get the question all the time when I travel about this, but you know, I think that he would say and I would say uh, that, um, you know, we do have this sort of, um, we, you know, our country is a little bit different in that we believe in this rugged individualism, uh, you know, uh, and uh, so uh, there's traditional resistance to uh, things that limit or that are perceived to limit choice, perceived to uh, um, uh, uh, limit one's uh, options, and um, a uh, resistance to centralization. Um, and, uh, you know, it is part of our political culture. And, um, you know, you can see in the debate today that that's still true. Um, but it doesn't obviate the fact that we have, a, in, we have an unsustainable, we had an unsustainable system that absolutely demanded reform. And, um, you know, now the question is, can we move forward, implement it, and make progress on uh, this issue, understanding that we're not going to make some big transition to a single payer system, which is what most of these countries have. But perhaps we can embrace the concept that um, no one should go without uh, health coverage. And, uh, you know, that I think is an achievable goal. Sure. This one? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, John Alverdi, I'm a general surgeon here. Can you? Speak a little uh, bit about uh, your choice of coming to uh, the University of Chicago, perhaps, and maybe uh, in the context of your talk, uh, how you see um, embedding some of your politics into the uh, Institute of Politics here. Well, I actually came here for superior medical care. <laughs> Listen, I, 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 I've learned how to pander over the years. Um, no, I, uh, look, first of all, it's not mine to insert my politics uh, at the IOP. Uh, in fact, you know, in the last year, we had 159 speakers from January to June. We opened our doors in January. Those speakers uh, ranged from uh, uh, Newt Gingrich and Haley Barber uh, uh, to Jerry Brown and Gary Hart, who was a fellow uh, here and you know our goal is not to um, inculcate 
young people with a particular point of view, but to expose them to many points of view. And one of the things that's wrong with our politics right now is we've organized ourselves in such a way that people tend to have their own views affirmed rather than being exposed to other views. And uh, there's not a lot of respectful debate or recognition that perhaps there are other uh, answers that make some sense or some amalgam of views make sense. And so, uh, you know, we try this quarter, um, you know, we have uh, 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 Robin Carnahan as a fellow who was at Secretary of State in, uh, in Missouri, ran for the U.S. Senate there, comes from a great Democratic family. There we have uh, Vin Weber, who is a conservative Republican congressman from Minnesota, and Ramesh Panaru, uh, one of the uh, uh, great, incisive, uh, younger thinkers in the conservative movement who writes for the National Review. Um, I'm glad for our kids to be exposed to all of them. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, what our goal is at the Institute of Politics is to try and encourage young people to get into the public arena, if not as candidates, then as policymakers, strategists, commentators, uh, because, uh, you know, and I'm sure all of you who deal with young people here, and there are a lot of young people in the room, uh, know this, that uh, I think this is the most public-spirited group of young people that I've met since the 60s. Uh, and I, I was thinking about why that was the other day. Uh, I kind of think of my generation as a lost generation because, uh, you know, our parents went through a depression and a world war. There was a sense of sacrifice, a sense of common purpose. And even when we had big debates, th those debates uh, did not spill into um, the kinds of ugliness that we uh, see, I think it was awfully easy for us. Our young people today have gone through 9-11. Uh, They've gone through now a, 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 a very devastating financial crisis. And what I see are young people who understand that there are problems in the world, there are challenges, and that they want to get in there and try and make things better. The real question is, is politics the way to do it? And that's a very good question, given the spectacle that we're witnessing today and that we see uh, every day in our newspapers and on cable television. And what I say to them and what I say to all of you uh, is that um, whatever the equity you care about, and obviously everybody's here because they care about health care, and that's a very prominent one, but if it's climate change, budget deficits, human rights, education, every single one of them is going to be impacted by the decisions that are made in Washington, in state capitals, in city halls, in world capitals. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that if you care about these equities, that you have the luxury to walk away from this. I think more, it's much more productive to get involved, to become part of the discussion, to, to try and guide the discussion to a more productive place. And ultimately, I'm actually more optimistic than most about the future because of young people and because I think that what I, what I see is more tolerance uh, what I see is more public spiritedness. And I think as this generation filters into positions of leadership, uh, we're going to see changes that we all want to see. And it may lead, not, it's not always going to lead to solutions that I wholly uh, approve of, or uh, you know, uh, you may wholly approve of. But I think it'll, there'll be thoughtful, more thoughtful answers, and we'll get past this episode we're in. So the point of the IOP is to make a contribution to that. And we're going to measure our progress based on the number of leaders that we produce. And we want to look back in 5 and 10 and 20 years and say there's some young people who passed through the Institute of Politics and now they're helping to uh, guide the public debate. So um, my job isn't to uh, persuade young people that my point of view is the right point of view. My job is to uh, encourage them to get in the arena and fight for their point of view.